On this Wondering Wednesday, I'm wondering, what is the purpose of a grade? Seems like a little bit of a silly question to ask, because certainly we must all agree on what the purpose of a grade is. We are given grades from the time we're small children in kindergarten, all the way up to the time we graduate high school, or even when we're in higher education, or graduate school, or some professional school. We're given those grades, so they must be really important. But do the grades that we receive in one class have a common purpose or a common measure with grades that we receive in another class? Do teachers and professor types like me have some sort of common understanding or agreement about how grades should be assigned in their purpose? I think you might be surprised to find out there's not a common agreement among the instructors who are assigning grades. So let's look at some of the ways that instructors and teachers assign grades and how they consider what they measure. So the first way to think about grades is as an absolute measure of performance. So the grade reflects some measure of mastery. You've set a bar at a certain level, at a certain grade, letter grade assignment, and when the student passes that bar, terms of competence, of demonstrating that they know the material, then they are assigned that grade. So they can keep on moving up and up, and as they demonstrate more mastery, they're going to get a better grade. Now, we would assume that we might have a normal distribution, if we have enough students in our class, across these different grade levels. Some students are going to master all the concepts that we teach in a course, some are not going to master nearly enough. The instructor sets the bar, and that bar is maintained throughout the semester. However, we have a situation here where we could have the possibility that all of our students could get an A. So they could all master this material, and they could all get an A in this course. However, we also have a situation where everybody could get an F. Every single person in that course could get an F as well. So that's one way that we consider this kind of assignment of a grade based on an absolute measure of performance. The other way that grades can be assigned is by assigning them based on the relative performance of a student group. So one particular class, that peer group, how are they doing relative to each other? So this has some interesting effects. So for example, you might have a 90% mastery of the material, which normally would get you an A in a course that is using an absolute measure of performance. But you happen to have the bad luck to be in a course that's filled with geniuses that have much higher level mastery than you do. And so that bar is moved down and that 90% mastery is only going to get you a C in that course. Okay, so different peer groups are gonna have different places or different bars that are going to be set. So this is the so-called grading on a curve and it means that you're going to be judged relative to your peers. Now, I understand why some professors might choose to use this method, thinking of grades as a relative measure amongst all the students in the class. It kind of keeps the heat on, right? You can't just get to the level um, of a 80% and say, I've got my B, I don't have to worry about it, because it may turn out that other people are working harder than you, and you may then fall down to a C or a D or something like that. So I kind of understand why professors might do that. It puts a lot more pressure to study and to get up to a top level in the course. Also, sometimes we want to weed out those students, uh, or perhaps those professors want to weed out those students that they don't think will perform at the very top level. My philosophy is a little different. I figure if you've been admitted into a program, you should be able to pass and be successful in that program. And so that's why I tend to use that absolute bars where you set those bars. There's a couple other problems with the relative measure or using grades assigned relative to what a particular cohort is doing. One is that cohorts change from semester to semester. 
So if you happen to take a course in the fall and there's a bunch of Einsteins in that class, well, you may not do very well. Well, maybe that same performance next spring when we have a quote-unquote normal uh, level of intellect in that uh, course or that uh, preparedness in that course, you may find that that same performance that got a C in the fall would get an A in the spring. Okay, so I think that's a little bit problematic philosophically, or at least I have a problem with that. Many professors do not. I also um, think about that over time, um, and not only over time, but also within a given semester. Sometimes we have a course that is so large that we cannot have one professor doing all the grading. So if you take the course from Scott and you take the course from John and they are using, um, one's using an absolute measure or a relative measure, um, that can be a problem. But also, even if they're both using relative measures, well, then you get into the situation where what is this cohort uh, and what is this cohort? And so once again, uh, it can be either an easier or a more difficult class because of that. Now, with the absolute measures that I tend to favor, there are some problems as well. One of the big criticisms of it is that you tend to have grade inflation. Okay, so grades can go up with time. And why does that grade of inflation occur? Well, there are probably several reasons we could see grades moving upward. Good reasons might be that we have better students. So we're increasing our admission requirements, perhaps uh, previous courses, the previous institutions that the students went to better prepared them to master the material. Perhaps we're getting better at teaching. Maybe I'm now a fantastic teacher and I'm just able to impart my wisdom much more easily and much more succinctly. I, I don't know if I would buy that, but there could be something to that. Better te teaching methodologies, better simulations, better ways to convey the information. Better outside help. Maybe we have more resources that we've deployed within our institution to help students do well in the course, and they're taking advantage of that. There could also be some reasons why grades are going up that are not so good. Maybe we're dumbing down the course. We've lowered that uh, bar. Um, perhaps, you know, grading is hard to do and Darn if those students don't argue all the time about their grades, so why don't we just um, be an easier grader, be a lax judge of the quality of work. So that's one bad thing that may be happening that we would see causing grades to inflate. Perhaps teachers are motivated by popularity. There is a correlation with grades and student evals. The more A's you give, the better your student evals are. And so this is especially leveled against graduate students um, who may be getting their PhD and need to have some good teaching evaluations to show to the institutions where they're applying for jobs. As you can see, there's not a real agreement on what is the purpose of a grade. And I would suggest you might want to ask your professors, those that are assigning you a grade, what do they think the purpose of a grade is? Thank you, and thanks for joining me on this little journey through this Why Wondering Wednesday. No, it's not a Why Wednesday. It's a, it's a Wondering Wednesday. Thank you for joining me.